Welcome to Bearwood. A spectacular building with an extraordinary history. The mansion has lived countless lives and can tell a million stories. In this series, we will bring these tales to life and uncover pockets of time from Bearwood's past. Each episode will begin using a photo of Bearwood chosen by students here at Redham House. Welcome again to the magnificent Bearwood Mansion. Built between 1865 and 1874, it has been a Victorian country house and a World War I convalescent hospital. For the last hundred years, Bearwood has been dedicated to education with a strong nautical connection, home to the Royal Merchant Seamen's Orphanage, the Royal Merchant Navy School, more recently Bearwood College and now Redham House. Every aspect of Bearwood's history is fascinating. In this series, we are going to explore tales from Bearwood's past and uncover its fascinating change over time. To do this along the way, we will use photographs to showcase Bearwood then and Bearwood now. Across five episodes, you have three fantastic guests to look forward to. Journalist and The Times historian Christopher McCain. Star of the stage and screen Dame Harriet Walter, whose own family ancestors built and resided in that house. And last but not least, Sylvia Lambert, who at the age of eight in 1945 was the youngest girl here at the Royal Merchant Navy School. All of this brilliant history to uncover, but in our first episode, we're gonna go back to the start, to the origins of Bearwood, to find out why we're all here. One family is central to the story of Bearwood. Without them, we wouldn't be here, because originally, the land where Bearwood lies was nothing extraordinary. From 1574, it was part of the Royal Forest of Windsor, used by the Crown as hunting grounds. That all changed in 1816, when the land was bought by John Walter II. Over the next hundred years, the pioneering Walter family would completely transform Bearwood. But who were they? Well, to kick things off, John Walter I started the dynasty. In 1785, he founded a newspaper, the Daily Universal Register. On the 1st of January 1788, this was renamed The Times. His son, John Walter II, revolutionised the paper. With this success and great wealth, he bought 158 acres at Bearwood, as well as the surrounding 146 acres in 1816. By 1822, the original Georgian house at Bearwood had been built. His son, John Walter III continued the legacy. On his watch, the Bailwood estate peaked at over 7,000 acres. He knocked down his father's house and built the current mansion, described by Mortimer Collins as the palace of a prince of the press. But the Times was not only fundamental to Bearwood. With John Walter II as proprietor, they rose to become the most powerful newspaper in Britain in the 19th century. How did they do this? Well, to find out more about the Times and the role that John Walter II played, I've been speaking to journalist and the Times historian, Christopher McCain. One coup of his, that his obituary in the Times when he died, uh, particularly focuses on as his great achievement was the introduction of steam printing. And the background to that was that uh, his, his printers, his compositors, 
could virtually control printing. And the way this happened was a standard press could only print 250 sheets of paper an hour on one side. And that meant that if your circulation was rising, you would probably have to have three or four versions of each page set up in type. And this meant lots more money for the compositors because they were setting everything three or four times. And that was the only way with this hand operated stand up press that you could get your print run completed. So Walter decided on a different approach. He got in touch with two German press makers, Koenig and Bauer, and they were inventing essentially a steam press. Which, would be, which was to revolutionize printing. Now, Walter bought two of these presses. He bought them in secret. Just for comparison, Stannard Press, 250 sheets an hour, Koenig and Bauer Press, 1,200 sheets an hour on both sides of the paper. And he bought two of these monster presses. And he, he, they had to assemble them in London. And they set up a site near to Printing House Square at Blackfriars and they built these two presses. And the, the unions did get wind of this and they started saying they were threatening destruction to John Walter and all his traps. It was a personal vendetta, but there were livelihoods were at stake because this was gonna, the abolition of the duplicate and triplicate setting was gonna affect a lot of jobs. Anyway, um, the time came when Walter had got these presses ready to go. He tested them in secret. And on the night that he was going to go for it, he told the, he told the press men in the press hall, we're going to hold the edition because I'm expecting important news from the continent. This was not unusual. And deadlines were pretty flexible. And if it was a big story, you'd wait to get it into the paper. So the press men all stood by. And at six o'clock, John Walter took charge of the operation himself, of course. At six o'clock in the morning, he walked into the press hall holding damp copies of the Times and said, the Times is already printed by steam. And that was, that was the, end of, the end of that. I mean, the run went perfectly and he had no problems from that. Um, all the, all, many of the printers were laid off. Uh, but he took them back on. He was a benevolent employer and they came back eventually, but it was a different world for them because the st and the presses, of course, uh, could cope with the necessary increased circulation. And uh, just for comparison, the presses the Times runs now, the Man Roland, also German presses, um, each press will print 86,000 copies in an hour in color. So things have moved on, but Walt, and Walter's, the steam printed presses were then sold around the world. Koenig and Bauer's name was made and printing was revolutionized. As well as being proprietor, John Walter II was also a printer by trade and a master of his craft. And he wasn't afraid to get his hands dirty. In 1810, this is before the steam presses came in, which came in 1814, um, his printers struck over a pay dispute and they all disappeared on Saturday. That was a good day for a strike because no paper on Sunday. So John Walter set to, he hired a few casual compositors and he rolled up his own sleeves. He himself worked incessantly for 36 hours, as his obit said, at case and press. And the paper came out on Monday and the striking printers couldn't believe it. And it came out for the next few months or so without any intervention from them at all, with the proprietor doing a lot of the heavy lifting in the case room and on the presses. And he loved that actually, because many years later, when he was an MP for Berkshire in 1833, he was alone in Printing House Square one morning and news came in from France at 10 o'clock in the morning. What did Walter do? There's nobody there. He translated the dispatch, set it up in type himself. And when the staff came in at noon, they found the proprietor working at case with his sleeves rolled up and getting the paper out on his own. He was that sort of bloke. <laughs> this industrial spirit was shared by John Walter III. When this mansion was half complete, the bricklayers went on strike and John Walter III himself rolled up his sleeves like his father and got on with the job without them. But 
What about the original house at Bearwood? Where does that fit into our story? By 1816, Walter was, he wasn't losing interest in the Times, but he wanted to start another career as an MP. And he also, he was unmarried. He also wanted a place in the country where he could relax and get away from it all and, and well, and get married and have a family and all the rest of it. So he scouted about and he found Bearwood, which was a wood. It was on the Crown Estate. And he bought 158 acres of land at Bearwood and uh, another surrounding 146 acres. Interestingly, in today's prices, he paid £300,000 for the land and nearly a million pounds at today's prices to build a house. Anyway, the house was quite, well, it was only 40 miles from Printing House Square. And in those days, because you travel by coach, he'd have gone down for the weekend by coach and you would average about 10 miles an hour in a coach. So 40 miles to Bearwood, four hours. If you're going down the slow lane of the M4, I calculate, it would take you four hours. But of course, you had to stop for fresh horses and so on. So it take the best part of half a day to get there. So when he got there, what did he do? He loved fishing. And part of the attraction of Bearwood was the water there, the lakes as they are there now and still stocked with fish. And he and his friend were great anglers, and that was a big attraction. He also was interested in the countryside. He loved chopping wood for relaxation, and he set about replanting and a lot of um, a lot of work in the gardens at Bearwood, some of which, of course, is still is still visible. So the house took quite a long while to build. It wasn't finished till 1822. And it, it's a conventional Georgian house, but he used a local architect. It was all a bit, it wasn't beautifully designed at all. And Henry Crabb Robinson, who was a great pillar of the times and the first foreign correspondent went down there. And he said it was, uh, it had a certain deformity of structure. It's certainly, if you look at the pictures of it, it had no symmetry about it. Crab Robinson thought the back was better than the front. But anyway, um, this, this became Walter very much his base out of London and, and to practice his favourite diversion of fishing. I'm standing next to the massive portrait of John Walter III, which shows him with a copy of the Times newspaper and a bust of his father behind him. And when John Walter II died in 1847, then his son really did take on the mantle of proprietor of the Times. And again, it was the wealth generated by the newspaper which allowed JW3 in 1865 to demolish the Georgian house that used to be here at Bearwood and in its place build the Bearwood that we know today. This uh, pseudo Jacobean pile a massive rambling red brick affair with quite out of character with his father's much more modest Georgian country house, um, but which very much reflected the power of the proprietor of the times and the amount of money the paper was making by then. The influence of the times became absolutely enormous. This palace of a prince of the press was built using 4,468,000 bricks, 3,347 tonnes of Mansfield stone. But what was life actually like at Victorian Bearwood? Well, we're going to uncover some more stories in the next episode, both of opulence and tragedy.